Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Nicole, Nicole Tremetier. Looking forward to our conversation, Nicole. I'm pleased that I kind of think I got your surname right. That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, so, thank Nick, you. <clears throat> um, uh, as well, Nicole is uh, as well as being uh, an adoptee. Uh, you're a you're a therapist too. So, yes. I, I, that it, it makes makes for an awesome uh to use an american phrase american word uh conversation i think you know that the the lived experience and also the uh your your own learnings and the learnings that you get professionally is the kind of the the gold dust that we want to to mine really for that yeah the tribe so yeah. um we're focusing very much at the moment in on healing so what what does that word mean to you? What does healing mean to you, Nicole? Well, <clears throat> it means that the pain that you've endured over time, that you're aware of it, and that you take active steps to try to understand it, learn from it, and then eventually heal from it. Uh, are you talking about lessen lessening the pain well processing the pain processing the pain okay to an adaptive state okay so can you explain a little bit more? okay so the the best way for me to explain it is that <clears throat> with the work that i do and i use um emdr and yeah. various forms of emdr like flash emdr um when we when we can identify what the pain is or where its roots are, then we can go in and with our body, just we scan our body, notice where we feel discomfort around a specific issue. And then we use the bilateral stimulation to process that as we would if it process it in a way that um if we didn't have it stuck in our brain. We would just do it anyway with with when we go to sleep, with REM sleep. Um, so we are actively trying to recreate the the cycle of REM sleep. Basically, it's why you're awake. And then um, what I find is that those memories, those, those memories attached to um, pain or discomfort or you know, traumatic ex experiences did not fully... Um, what is the right word? Con consolidate with, you know, the with all the other memories. So <clears throat> EMDR creates the consolidation of the memory and um, then allows the person to be free of the discomfort of a memory. And they may look at it in a very different way. So it doesn't um, hurt them as much. It doesn't feel as, as, um, can't think of the right word. I'm sorry. Um, okay. As reactive to said memory, whichever we're, whatever we're focused on. So um, I think that adoptees have a lot of unconsolidated memories um, and memories that they may not remember because if it's pre-verbal before they can talk and explain and tell you what's going on. So infant to three, maybe. Um, there may be a lot of unconsolidated memories re with regard to their adoption. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of circumstance in the fact that they are they are taken away from their their birth mother, the the person that they that they felt all through those nine months. So maternal separation is one of those unconsolidated mem unconsolidated memories. It doesn't matter if you were adopted at birth; you they still have that. Yeah. So um, I was going to ask you another kind of uh, intellectual yeah. question on okay. this, um, but perhaps you could, uh, could, could you explain, I, I presumably you are uh, practicing this. Yes. Therapy because it benefiting, you, you benefited it from yourself. Is that, is that right? Yes. And I'm still in process actually, because as a therapist, it's very difficult to find a therapist that does the exact same thing and understands it the exact same way 
Um, <clears throat> and so the healing has been gradual uh, based on what I was dealing with at the moment. A new therapist is attachment healing. So that to me is the a big part of what I need in order for me to feel safe and comfortable developing a healthy relationship with another person. So the um, you, you're talking you, you're talking about consolidating. Yes. The memory. <clears throat> Is, um, that, is that is that because I'm actually doing this myself at the moment. So I'm okay. In, I'm in therapy uh, at the moment. We've done little bits of EMDR, but we're going to do more of them, right? So right. Um, consolidating the 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 memory for me has been about kind of stepping in stepping into the pain. Mm -hmm. um, Feeling it, scanning the body, as you said, right. in the plane, fe feeling it, and and uh, 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 and then kind of surfacing the grief. Yes, surfacing in the some grief. In a lot of cases, yes. I, I I would like to just say that the way I have been doing it recently, and and so the way that you're doing it is not wrong, but the way that I've been doing it recently is because I deal with a lot of complex trauma. I I try not to have them feel a lot of pain that takes them out of their window of tolerance. Um, so I would use flash EMDR on the things that feed that memory or that experience. So with flash EMDR, it's a little bit different. There is no um, need for you to feel the discomfort, except only in the beginning when we decide what we're working on. And usually people don't, have a, a a really bad reaction to that but so well what i do is i i notice that when i clear out the negative cognitions that that fuel the target whatever we're we're going to work on when i do then the full protocol which um is you know what that is like you do emdr with your with your therapist then i notice that there's they're less reactive and they're they're able to stay in their window of tolerance better so if if you look up the flash technique, just flash technique on Google, you'll you'll see Phil Phil Mansfield is the creator of that. And I took two of his trainings and um that really and I think I just played around with it. And I think that when you're a um a certified EMDR therapist, you've kind of like looked at different ways of doing things. And so I I I realized that when I use the flash technique first that really kind of like just gets every all the junk out of the way and there's less reactivity it doesn't mean that you're not feeling it it's just less so it, it's a, a a less violent reaction to the pain correct okay. and to me that's so important because you got, I mean, we're holding all this pain and it, and unprocessed pain in some of it is pre-verbal. So that's why the body is so important. You know, like if you feel, you know, this, feel it in your gut or your core, in your throat, um, those are typically, you know, the body sensations that many adoptees, you know, seem to experience and people in general that have trauma where they couldn't say what they needed to say. They couldn't defend themselves. They couldn't say what they needed. Um, because they didn't have words, right? Right. Pre-verbal, pre meaning like before you could talk or yeah. understand or, you know, um, thinking complex um, conversations and reactions. Like we don't know, but we, our body knows. And so we follow the pain. You know, so this is a bottom-up approach. We follow the pain. So if, even if you don't say anything to me and I ask you, where do you feel it in your body? You say, oh, I feel it, you know, in my chest, in my throat, in my back. I just say, go with that. And the the bilateral kind of helps process that. And you'll notice if it goes up or down. And our, the goal is to get it is down as far as we can. So um, to an ecological state. Or so zero. Just just for people that 
don't know and and, and I'm just checking and that's yeah. when you say bottom up mm-hmm. you're you're referring to starting with the body rather Correct. than the head yeah yep rather than so, the head cognitive behavioral therapy is a top down therapy talk therapy is a top down therapy and we notice i mean if we're talking about a person that does not have like loads and loads of trauma talk therapy is fine Talk therapy is fine. They they need to they need help making the decision. We're we're looking for patterns of 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 ways that they do things, and you know we kind of maybe help help them learn a little bit more about that. Bottom up is with people with complex trauma. There is no talk down therapy that is going to do anything except stir things around. And so, if you want healing, the bottom up with the body is the way to go. Yeah, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously the, the so the reason I started this therapy is because I kept on hearing from um adoptive therapists like yourself that mm-hmm. this is pre-verbal. So mm-hmm. we we we're we're if if it's pre-verbal, we haven't got words for it, we haven't got a concept of it, we can't express it into words. It's not a logical thing. Or so, even memory. Or, or, or memory, yeah, we haven't, got, we haven't got a memory of it, we haven't got words for it, we haven't got any concepts mm-hmm. with it. All we've got is this, is that what people talk about, the cellular memory? And, you know, that's yeah. the coke and the body keeps the yep. school. Yep, that's right. And it, and it could be even generational because, like, you think about if, 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 a, if a mother is carrying around a child, that she's being shunned by her community, she's being, you know, um, she, feels forced to give the child up for adoption. Um, the the child's father is no longer in the picture. He's like, why did you get pregnant? You know, all these things. Um, so maybe there's a lot of stress there. So that baby feels that stress, you know? And looking at her birth and life, maybe there was turmoil in her family and generations. I mean, it just, it just never stops. And well, it just carries on on the cellular level, generationally, this kind of pain, where, you know, the specificity of it will, is different from person to person, you know? Yeah. So to sum up then, by healing, you mean a less, uh, a, a, a less extreme reaction to emotional pain. Yeah, and that's... And, and more of an understanding, you know, um, to take all the prickly stuff out of memories or situations or ways that you would like to be, you know. So if adoptees are very, very um, clingy with their partners, especially in the beginning, I mean, it actually drives them away, right? And so you want to learn how to be authentically yourself and not overtly needy or pick you know whatever um because doing behaviors that 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 say i'm not safe you're not safe so um to go into a relationship with less reactivity more openness you know and even if it doesn't work out the ability to let it go um you know i mean have your grieving sure you know natural grieving but not like you know, um, perseverating on it for years and years and years. So what we're talking about here is, what you're talking about here is is a a less extreme reaction. Correct. From from us uh, is is going to uh, cause less um, uh, insecure behaviors. behaviors. And and, and, uh, we're not going to be holding on to our relationships as tightly uh, and therefore we're not going to be suffocating correct we're not nobody gonna... nobody deals good with that even adoptees if someone's suffocating us we don't like that either yeah you know and um so it just it just may create more balance and if you stay in therapy while you're engaged in a relationship then maybe you can develop some new insights um, I, I think EMDR is 
it, or flash EMDR and EMDR is um, something that may take time. You may not realize that you have a specific something um, until maybe six months in the relationship. And yeah, I need to do something about that. Yeah. Let me, let me bring, let me process that. By, I mean, talk to my therapist. I would ask, you know, what negative cognition is associated with this situation? And then, so it's, it might say, um, I can't let my feelings out or, um, you know, I'm not in control. Control is a big thing with us, right? Because we haven't, we, we didn't have control as a kid with the things that went on that led to our adoption and placement in a family, you know, maybe control is something that we use as a coping mechanism to feel safe, but maybe it feels intrusive to another person. Yeah. So w one of the things I saw this, I saw this morning is uh, a fellow adoptee mm -hmm. de describing herself as an ex people pleaser. Yes, I love that. It, it's really a, fan, a a different name for codependency. Um, and we learn how to be codependent as kids a lot of times. Um, and, and with my family, it was a large adoptive family. So that was a way to maybe get some reassurance or some um, get ways for, for them to notice, you know, that I'm here, <laughs> which is like one of my things, you know, like being like how I feel like there's a lot of times I would get left out or I didn't get the rewards, even though I worked really hard because there's just too many kids to like, okay, it's the ones that were louder. I was more quiet, you know? And um, so, yeah, I think that's, that definitely is a thing. Yeah. What, what it struck me is that um, we, we've taken something that's a behavior there and mm -hmm. made it an identity. Yeah. Um, now, I, I'm sure that that person sometimes did some people pleasing and sometimes didn't do people pleasing. It was yes. a behavior, you know, that it was, that, that was present and then, and and then um, absent, and but w what we do is I I, I feel uh, what I I have done is taken a like what is a transient behaviour and made it into a thing, hmm. made made it into part of my identity. So I, so th there's a big there's a big difference between um, I I sometimes do some people pleasing and. I'm a people pleaser. Uh, mm -hmm. They that seems very to me that seems very significant because once we've kind of embraced, uh, once we've em embraced a behaviour as part of identity, then we're more, um, yeah, we're we're more stuck with it. We we kind of like we're painting ourselves into a corner there, right. I mean, I call myself a recovering codependent. So like, I'm very aware of um, some of that behavior. Sometimes I fall back into it without realizing it, but um, you know, the power to say no. Um, and like, sometimes saying no is the hardest thing for people pleasers. So I practice this with my clients. I'm like, practice because if, if they come in I'm like I don't want to do x y and z but I know that I'm going to end up doing it well let's practice saying no like in the first three letters of what you say tell say no because no is very important no I can't do that today no that's something that I, I can't do or no I'm not going to be able to pick up you after work or whatever um there's just it's just like like chalk I mean, nails on a chalkboard, like the idea of saying no to somebody. Um, and so what I, I, one of the things my, one of my clients taught me, which they teach me stuff all the time is um, this woman, she was telling me that um, her mother-in-law taught her that if someone asks you to do something, if it's not convenient for you, then it's a no. So it might be something that, oh, yeah, I could do that. You know, can you pick up so-and-so after school? If the person, 
if it's not convenient for them, the answer should be no. Yeah. So, um, I'm, it's something that I practice and sometimes I fall back into the codependency, then it, it, it's, it's uncomfortable. And I feel all these emotions when I fall back into it. And then I'm like, uh-uh, let's go back. Let's reset, you know. But the thing else I picked up last week um, is on, on social, which was it, it, it takes it takes an experience to overcome an experience. Yeah. So the yeah. experience, the experience of um, grief, mm -hmm. the experience of loss of a, a birth mothers, right? Mm -hmm. That that's that's a lived that's a lived experience, and therefore yeah. it, it it needs an experience or or a series of experiences to kind of to 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 um uh, to to wipe that. To, to to lessen the impact of of that, that stuff, yeah, which is why it's tricky on a podcast, which is all about talking. Mm -hmm. It we're we're having an intellectual conversation here. Mm -hmm. we, we're not uh, um, we're we're experiencing one another to to an mm -hmm. extent, but we're not actually having that experience like the experience of me with uh, with with Rachel. Um, mm -hmm. I, therapist and your your experience as a therapist with your clients mm -hmm. yeah and, and and i think if i look back so i had uh this was just last thursday right so it's probably about my fifth sixth session with rachel i had this huge thing of of you know her just saying uh well your 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 pain is anger and your anger is grief and, and she said it even more straightforwardly than that mm. and I just thought yes this is it and then I can also look back on my 16 years of exploration of this stuff mm -hmm. and see that probably 95% of it has been intellectual rather than experiential mm -hmm. so i'm wondering if you could talk talk into into that because i'm talking at it as a uh, as a consumer right 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 and you're, you you can talk at this as a consumer but and also as a as a yeah i mean it's sound and i think that adoptees often learn to intellectualize their experience and the behavior partly because our adopters fed us this narrative of like what we should think about this is oh you were chosen you know we loved you so much but the, the and that kind of negates the pain of the of the child um but they're just <laughs> but they're just repeating the lessons that they've been told they're just repeating the intellectual correct. stuff they've been told correct there's no malice involved um, typically, maybe some manipulations in, with some people, um, but I mean, all in all, I don't necessarily think that um, that it's malicious in any way. Um, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought. Yeah. I hate when I do that. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> um, I, I, I threw you. No, off. that's all right. That's all right. Um, so, can you say maybe like the last idea that you so, have? Yeah, so, talk? so the the idea that the idea that's coming to my head on the basis of, of what, what you just said about this absence of malice is mm -hmm. the fact that we we're, we're judging um 60s parenting right on on 21st century uh trauma yes that. yes and that's really unfair it is wow that's pretty deep because like i was just thinking about that you know, and I often say something like that to my clients when they're when they're saying something, um, you know, um, you know, because back in the 50s and 60s, you never talk about your family's business. You know, you don't air your dirty laundry. 
and and so if they were brought up with that and the idea of like you don't talk about what's going on in the family and da da da, da like we don't if that's not even the case we have like tiktok you're you're going to get exposed parents you know <laughs> and um so that is pretty profound but and the i think i'm circling back to what you were talking about before um this intellectualization that we that we do um i think now like when you go through therapy like you're you're actually like you, you have to go beyond the intellectualization. Your therapist will probably point that out. So when I do parts work, for instance, um, the the AMP, the apparently normal part, is the part of you that kind of on a, on a good day sh can show up with all of these great attributes. Um, but even within, like the, there is a part that to the world seems like the AMP, but it's really just, I need to get the, I need to get through this day. So I'm going to perform like my my authentic self, even though I'm not having a good day. So um, you know, when you start to learn more about yourself in a way that um, you can then express uh, a full range of emotions, um, you move from the intellectual to the authentic. And so that is a journey. And, and if people don't take the journey, then they're going to be doing that for the rest of their life. You know, I also believe that a lot of a lot of um, adoptees struggle with a sense of identity, and doing this kind of work really helps them like own who they are. You know, and then they 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 see themselves for the very first time, like, wow, this is me. You know, it's not a manifestation of what you were taught you were growing up, or what the world says you are growing up, um, but you can learn to stand in your own authenticity, even the parts that aren't palatable to some others, you know? Yeah. So the way I see the parts work mm -hmm. is diff uh, uh, isn't, isn't it about us being us at different ages? Mm -hmm. I, 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 exhibiting certain behaviors, feeling certain things, okay, and, and how they and and the, and the different the different parts of us. So the kind of um, I'm thinking the exile, I'm thinking of that transition. I'm thinking of that that transition from um, elementary to high school, or from okay. what we would call primary school to to to, to secondary school. Okay. The, 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 um, we have to change we, we've gone we go from being the biggest the, the, the biggest kid the, top, the biggest kids in the school mm -hmm. you know we go from being top of the pile to bottom of the pile age range mm -hmm. size wise mm -hmm. and intellectual wise so there's a change there and, and we have to kind of um, we have to adapt and, and that transition phase can be very tricky and you know okay. and you, obviously in the states you have a lot of middle schools as well so basically what i'm getting around to saying is is that we we have different parts with us that are associated with different ages correct so and, and with with that said and and i i will just say um parts work may look like different things to different therapists um, there's IFS internal family systems that, that they might use words like the exile or the wise mind and things like that. And that, that's fine. Um, go with whatever your therapist, um, chooses in terms of a modality. Mine is more of like a hodgepodge thing. And I kind of like learn to, um, have people separate the part to look at them and notice how old they were when this part kind of you know, kind of got stuck. And so I have zero to three, three to six, you know, um, seven to nine. I mean, it's, and there's some adolescent parts and, and then maybe some young adult parts. But the idea is that when we show up every day and, and so like, let's say I'm organized, I'm not always organized, but I can be if I'm on a good day, um, that I'm happy, I'm resilient, I'm, um, um, compassionate, loving. So I put that in the category with the A and P. And keep in mind, 
that is just all the qualities on a good day that I that I have. And then I have these other parts where I'm like insecure or um, codependent, um, anxiety, you know, um, fear of rejection, which is one of the big ones with us. And then I just kind of like have like a little map of maybe some of the different ways that I feel in my body. And I also tell them to write down the body sensations. So that can help them notice like if they're feeling off, check in with their body, notice where they feel it. What What is this feeling related to? Oh, it's related to anger or sadness. Um, and that way you just become so much more aware of yourself and all the different states that you may experience in, over a day, over a week. And so I kind of use that to kind of decide what we're going to try to desensitize. So you had this situation where you felt, you know, this deep anger, not quite rage, but anger. And so I say, tell them what negative cognition is, is connected to that experience. And they might say, um, I'm not good enough because maybe what happened is a person dismissed them or didn't include them or whatever. So we find the negative cognitions associated with that experience. Then I use flash EMDR to desensitize that. Okay. They leave here. They leave my office. I'm in my office. They leave here feeling very, very um, good. And that is kind of like the joy of um, being a therapist is watching my clients experience something awful and leaving here with a smile that is the greatest reward and um and then they it also builds trust you know between the therapist and the and the client so so the so the parts work for you yes. is an entry point to get to the predominant pains felt yes. at this part of at that part of the adoptee's life Yes. And then that you're gonna look at you're gonna look at those pains and you're gonna express those pains um, and consolidate those process those emotions through the EMDR. Mm -hmm. So yeah, is Correct. that how it works? Yeah, 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 yeah. And but I also, um, you know, it flashy. It's not just for that, but like people come in, they had a car wreck, and they're having panic attacks. Flashy EMDR is great for that. I see them two times maybe and they're done they're just like i can't believe this this is so wild you know so i'm like okay so i can use this for people that have car accidents or i can use this for people who experienced a horrific you know incident or whatever i mean to me it's like i i need to pass this on to people with relational trauma whatever whatever that is um it might not be a quick fix like a car crash but we build on it as time goes on because it's not it's it's not like the car crash where i can do i can actually do a car crash probably in one session probably if the person doesn't have any other like serious traumas that kind of are intertwined with that but with relational trauma it's just kind of like it's a discovery and there's many steps to that discovery because you're working with you're working with different parts and different Right. So parts work is a is a foundational piece of it. And it and it also is a way for the client to know, am I ready to do some serious processing? I have a readiness checklist for the complex PTSD that I think it was Kathy Steele that made that the um she's a pretty well known trainer in the field. Um but yeah, I mean, to me, it, and I see so much avoidance of the parts work, and that means I have to go slower. Yeah. Because there's some people like, oh, I, I didn't do that, or I don't want to do that. And that just, that's okay. But there's some people like this, yeah. When it starts to click, it clicks. So with my experience, mm -hmm. I'm actually seeing pain and anger in all the parts. Okay. So I'm thinking of, uh, anger as a teenager i'm thinking of anger as a preteen in you know around 10 i'm thinking yeah. of anger now as a 56 year old so we're working on anger and and pain and, and grief that 
you know, they that makes that, a lot of sense. They're working on so because it's it's it, it's um, it's present, it's dominant through all the parts. Yeah, I noticed that too with the people I work with. You know, anxiety might be a component in almost every part that we identify, so it's not unusual at all. Um, that and so if 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 you were my client, I would maybe ask you depending on the situation, like, you know, what kind of negative cognitions feed that anger? And that may be a place to start with like some- Yes, yeah, she's done that actually. She's done that. Or, oh, or I just yabbered away about it and and, uh, and, and described it. it. It's, I find this thing, th this conversation that we're having great on one level on the un on the other level it's like this is not an experience listeners you are not i we're just talking yeah the, 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 the we're just talking um i heard this summed up absolutely fantastically right however good the menu is it isn't the food yeah it isn't the food it isn't the food. So all we're doing really here, listeners, is we're giving you a kind of an intellectual understanding. Yes. And I'm trying to throw my stuff in. Um, and Nicole's trying to throw her stuff in. And we're trying to give you that kind of like uh, an intellectual under understanding of this so that you can see whether it's something that's worth looking at for yourself. So one of the great things I found, sorry. I don't know. No. Go ahead. Is there anything that you want to add, add to that? I was just going to... No, 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 that's, that, you said it right, yeah. Um, One of the things that I got from, uh, out of parts work, oh no, before I go, back, before I go into that, right, As Rachel, my therapist, has, has basically said to me, no intellectual, no intellectual learning, Simon, at the moment. Yeah. So no listening to the body keeps the score, no listening, no watching videos about trauma, no uh, reading of uh, listening to audio books about neuroscience, mm -hmm. nothing about spirituality, consciousness or anything like that. Right. Zip. It's, it's, it's on hold. Right. So, um, and, and she said, well, I, I don't want you to get confused. Man. I'm, yeah. And I'm seeing, I'm, I'm seeing a, a lot of benefit from that because basically there's more space I've got. Yes, I've got that's a really space. good assignment for my intellectual folks. Yeah, because the it, it the intellectualization prevents them from feeling pain. That's the, that was their purpose. You know. Can you say that again because that's this gold. I said intellectualization was like the um. Uh, was helping them not feel pain. I understand that I have trauma because Bessel van der Kolk said the body keeps the score, but it allows us to intellectualize, put this 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 veil in between the information and our real pain. Like, so that is a very that's an excellent idea. So she 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 floated this idea, mm -hmm. and I said yes. And then at the start of the, the second, and I, and I complied. I didn't just mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. I was going to do it. I did actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, I'm listening, because I need to listen to something for some reason while I'm doing a, a walk in the dark. I, I listen to, I'm listening to fiction instead. Okay. So uh, I'm not listening to anything that's non-fiction. Nothing's intellectual. But here's the thing. So she, she laid this down, floated it. Mm -hmm. And then at the start of the, the next session, she actually set it out as, and I, uh, and I said that I'd complied with the, mm -hmm. done the assignment as, and I was doing the assignment. And she laid the, kind of laid the law down in a really nice way, but said, mm -hmm. well, if you don't do this, I can't, I can't work with you because I want the best for you. And that made me feel she was backing away from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, and I so 
my insecurity, some insecurity part jumped right in here. Mm -hmm. And then I I shared that with her, that I felt mm -hmm. it was unfair because, mm -hmm. you know, um, what what do they say in 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 um, in, in, uh, uh, in the courtroom? You know, when there's a, a legal drama, they say mm -hmm. asked and answered. Do you know what I mean by that? No. A asked, oh, asked and answered. Yeah. Asked and answered. Right? Like we've de we've dealt with that. Right. I, I, I've, I've, you've asked me this question. I've answered. Let's move on. That's how I felt. I felt that she was kind of backing away from it, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that made me very scared. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, and so I shared that with her, and, and and then that when we dug into that a little bit more, it became, um, you know, like a, a real, a real life kind of example, a, mm -hmm. a case study that helped us explore what was going on in my intellect and my feelings. And then mm -hmm. we could kind of, we could move on and it, it and it, it opened the re relationship. It deepened the trust. Yeah. She trusted earlier on. Yeah. So now uh, is she an adoptee or does she work with not. a lot? Of, see, so that's, that, that to me is like an honest mistake, an honest misstep, you know, um, if you don't know a lot about adoption, you don't know the primal wound of abandonment and rejection and things like that. So um, the fact that you were able to work with her through that is very powerful. And and it goes to show that therapists aren't don't make mistakes sometimes, you know, but the the power is whether or not you can repair that once something like that happens, you know. Yeah. So that's pretty powerful. She'd been she's not an adoptive specialist, but she had been recommended by a fellow yeah. adoptive. So, um, yeah. Um what uh, I want to go back to the uh, the the kind of the IFS, uh, so yes. internal financial systems, and and the so the founder of that is this guy called uh, Richard Schwartz. He goes as Dick, Dick Schwartz, and his his book title is huge. One of the book titles is huge. It's cut. It says "No Bad Parts." So yes, we are backing away from this idea of judgment. Yes, uh, and and for me, that's huge. I, I have judged negatively. I've 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 judged the parts of myself, parts of myself negatively. That's why right. reading the title, No Bad Parts, was like, yeah. you mean what? Yeah. There, there, there are no, no bad parts. As well as these different ages, these different age ranges and these different parts of, of ourselves, uh, it's Dick Schwartz that talks about um, the, what does he call it? The essential self, what does he call it? The... The authentic self, maybe? I don't know. I, I'm not an IFS trained um, clinician. I'm aware of some of, you know, the some of the language around that, but I'm not IFS trained. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's uh, it's a tricky question to ask you then. Um, he, he, he talks about the, up, I think he calls it the uppercase S self, the uppercase S self, right? Okay. And and this is our true self. Uh, so that it fits in with your authenticity. And the the kind of um the breakthrough for me from that has been that that uppercase S self is not wounded. Okay. Some of the other parts of me are wounded. So you've got this, you've got this two level thing going on. When mm -hmm. we talk about healing, it, it, it's, it, it, it's those individual parts of us. Um, it, it's the, uh, it's our psychological identity that, that feels wounded whereas our 
uppercase as self is always whole and 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 that for me is gold dust because it it explains the dichotomy that I think exists um if we if we look at our it goes to identity if we are our psychological identity then that psychological identity is going to be healing for the rest of our lives yeah but the uppercase s self or or what other people might call awareness Mm -hmm. that awareness it, it is is under woundable is is unwoundable it's not wounded because it it's not a thing it can't be wounded it, it, it sounds like it's it's functional you know without um without a lot of hiccups so i i don't know that i'm understanding everything because i said i'm not i have yeah, yeah. trained um but so like let's just say that you have this this higher self whatever and this part this is unpenetrable with negative things or whatever but i would say that you know i wonder in the beginning of the journey does it have everything right because there are no bad parts so the parts that are wounded we want to create healing with those parts and integrate it with the self because i don't think okay. there's that and, and and it's just my thought. There's I don't think there's bad anger. There's bad um, anxiety. But let's just say for anger, what does anger look like if it's healthy? Um, if if something happens and you were, you know, you experienced something that made you angry. Okay, like you're driving down the street, you somebody cut you off, you and whatever. Okay, that's anger. But then you notice the anger and then. The rest of your body, whatever, is just calms yourself down. And you, let's say you go to sleep and you wake up. Remember that guy that that cut you off? And you're like, yeah, he was probably in a hurry, or maybe he had to poop. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what I that's what I say when I'm when I'm when someone's getting on me um, in the on the road. Um, now, un unchecked or unhealed anger with that same situation might cause somebody to to go and start you know, pulling up close to the, the car, scaring the, the driver, beeping the horn, flashing the lights. That's, that's a, it's more like rage in a way. I'm like, that is not reasonable. That is uncalled for. And that's a little out of control, right? So um, now if that happens all the time with rage uh, or with anger or whatever turns into rage, then to me, that is like not functioning properly. No. Right, well, because it's causing you a visceral reaction. You're causing pain to another person. That is not healthy. No, and that's that. That was there were. I I could see discrete moments of rage through my life. That's what yeah. was tapping into therapy, but not the rage. Um. So rage then, rage then, rage then. So it's out of character rage. Rather yeah. than you know, I, I'm thinking of um, uh, uh, I don't know why uh, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of a football hooligan, right? Okay, uh, a soccer, yeah, a soccer hooligan. So we we don't have so much of this in the in in the UK anymore. Okay. But they're still they're still they're still there. They've just kind of gone and undercover a bit. But what you know, if you so if you're playing in the uh, the the, the first division in what is now the Premier League in in um, uh, soccer in in England, then you know you you play at at your own ground from the third from the third of third week of August. You every two weeks, right? Every two weeks you go to your home ground, and every other week you travel away and you you play somebody else away, right? So those the the kind of the the rage of these football hooligans would be every every Saturday they're gonna have uh, they they're gonna um, they're gonna fight. Hold on the, one second. Hold away. on. My client walked in. Let me put, stop the video for just a second. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for your patience, there, listeners. We just had to uh, pause that. So the the um, the the rage that that football hooligan 
uh, expresses is is week in week out and 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 that that's that's all the time whereas with mine it was just like odd moments of right right huge um yeah huge rage and because they were there was a bit of distance between them Mm -hmm. i can look back on them and say well they were they were it was uh, out of character out of character stuff Mm -hmm. and that was looking back on it now that was kind of the clue so and maybe you you did this with your therapist my question would be like what was what was the event that led up to the rage is there any kind of um pattern that you see yeah um there was uh um, rejection okay yep um, That's the big wound. The, 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 there was rejection. The, yeah, I would say there was. There was rejection. Um, there was uh, uh, perceived animosity by the other person. There was a uh, lack of empathy. Like the, I, I, it was. Well, we, we're back to the football and soccer analogy. It was moments when I, when I thought somebody else wasn't on my side in a really yeah. unfair, bad way. That, yeah, that, I can that, relate that, to that. I I can relate to that rage. It's very uncanny. It's very like over the top, and people like with their responses, like "What the heck? What what what?" what? <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, that is um, that's very interesting. I think that might be common with a lot of, and and some people it's outward, other people it's inwards. You know, they 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 their rage is inward, which is pretty destructive. Uh, but yeah, I think that is really important. Yeah, and we're back to that piece, aren't we, about healing being uh, less uh, less powerful reactions to events. Correct. Uh, and we're talking about less powerful feelings and less powerful behaviors. That yeah, we're looking at feeling driving. Yeah feeling driving behavior, driving results. So we're going upstream of the results, like uh, the the length of our relationships to, Mm -hmm. to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the feelings like, uh, or or, or the actions like in, you know, um, people pleasing or uh, um, what do we call it? Uh, um, Uh, trying to hang on desperately, trying to hang, oh, yeah, yeah, hang, yeah. hang on, clinging, being clean, clinging, yeah, clinging behavior. So, yeah, relationships failing due to clinging behavior, due to felt insecurity, felt pain. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah, and picking people that are going to recreate that for us every single time. You know, I knew that I started healing. When this, there was a one person, I won't mention their name, that I was just like, it was more of like um, obsession, obsession, limerence, whatever. I mean, it was unequal in the sense that um, I don't think they liked me as much as I liked them. And um, I would do anything, right? And get up at three o'clock in the morning for them. And then when I realized, when I started to, to really own like me and love me and protect me, you know, um, that behavior wasn't working for me anymore. And they felt me pulling away. And the reason why I pulled away is because that person isn't healthy for me. And I want to protect my mental health. I want to protect my spiritual health. And that person was not aligned with my values at the time. And that is something that would be unseen. You know, like I would, even if the relationship was was not healthy for me, I would still try to hold on to it because what does it mean if it fails? So yeah. I so I I won't get into another relationship until I feel like I'm sufficiently healed with this emotional trauma. And I'm not in a hurry. Yeah. You know? have, have you been on uh, have you been on the other side of it as as well? Because um on the other side of clinging behavior by the Oh by yeah. The- and it, it feels 
it, it feels awful. Uh, I don't like it. And so that is, you know, something to be said. If I feel myself going down that road, I'm like, I can pause. I'm like, what is this about? You know? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it had a really bad experience. Almost, like, borderline stalking, if not stalking. And um, it was very, very uncomfortable. Yeah. And there was, it felt like fear. So I, if I ever find myself doing that to somebody else, I, I, I have to really nip it in the bud. Yeah. Yeah. The, I went out with a girl for a couple of months before I got together with my wife and been with my wife since, well, 30 years. No, okay. 30 years. Um, I went out with this girl for a couple of months before that. But she had me on some sort of pedestal of perfection. And I just, I thought, um, that yeah. was a weird one. Yeah, everybody has their stuff, you know. And I'm, I always tell people, how 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 long does it take to get to know somebody? And they say, well, really, you know, like maybe six months. And so a person who is not well or needs some healing, you know, the they'll show up. They, they can't hold it for more than three months, maybe six months. If Or else if it's six months, I think there's some, you know, some blinders on of the other person, you know? Yeah. Um, That's an, in, it's an interesting for me to reflect as the, um, the, 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 the person clung on to and the person mm -hmm. doing the clinging on. Yeah. That's an interesting thing when I can think about stuff. Yeah. In my 20, early 20s when I did that. Yeah. And Simon, how... I actually have to go because I have my client yeah. and yeah. I don't want to be late for her. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're going to have to do this. Um, we're going to have to do this again, Nicole. This has okay. been uh, uh, a beautiful good. conversation. So Thank I'll, you. Uh, uh, have a great session with your client and um, All right. thank you for sharing your time with us this afternoon and thank you listeners for listening and we'll speak to you again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.